Hello and welcome to today's webinar on workplace discrimination, harassment and bullying. My name is Sarah Sabell and I'm joined today by Michael Meir, Cal Director and Lecturer. Hi Michael. Hello Sarah, hello everybody. Nice to have the opportunity to join you and meet a few of the uh, small business owners in and around Richmond where Cal has its city campus. That's right Michael, it's great to see some of our usuals and some of our current students joining us today and it's also great to have some newcomers who are some small business owners in and around Richmond. Now we are going to be pushed for time, Michael has got a jam-packed agenda uh, but we do just have a few housekeeping items to get through quickly first. This uh, webinar will run for about 45 minutes, actually I think it will probably run for more like an hour and the last half will be opened up to your questions. So if at any time during Michael's presentation you have a question that you would like to ask him, just jot it down in your questions or chat box there on your dashboard and I will read them out so that Michael can answer them for everybody to hear. This webinar will also be available for you to keep. I will have the slides, the PowerPoint slides and the link emailed out to you once we're done here. Now Brody Pamlock, a 19 year old waitress, tragically took her own life after enduring persistent and vicious bullying at her work. Evidence raised in the resulting court case revealed that Brody had been the subject of continual physical and emotional abuse. In one of the more horrific incidents provided as testimony in this case, Brody was physically restrained while her manager and the owner of the cafe poured oil over her. In court, Brody's mother, Mrs. Ray Panlock, commented on her daughter's experience. She said, she was a very strong person. She used to just soldier on and get over what, whatever was going on. But the impact was just too much. It was not just one person, it was four men, the owner and three others. They just kept on pursuing her. The people who worked there other than these men did try but not hard enough. A lot of them said in their court case that they wished they had done more. Brody's father discussed the effect that his daughter's suicide had on his family. It impacted on our family. It was not just Brody. She did the ultimate task, if you want to call it that. It affected the whole family. It's not just us, but our other children, their grandparents, cousins, and so on. In Victoria, anti-bullying legislation known as Brody's Law commenced in June 2011 and this made serious bullying a crime punishable by up to 10 years in jail. So Michael, criminal uh, bullying is a criminal offence now. Yes, Sarah. Michael, I can certainly see the need for this law, but how does it impact on business owners and managers? What are we going to cover today? Um, Sarah, today's topic is all about the obligation and the legal requirements that all business owners have to ensure that their staff uh, are safe from workplace harassment, discrimination in all its guises. This means all forms of discrimination, general harassment, sexual harassment and the most insidious of all, workplace bullying. So our agenda for today will deal with definitions of harassment, bullying and discrimination, statistics, the employer and employee responsibilities, what the legislation says and how our Cal Package can assist you and also of course we'll answer your questions. Excellent Michael, now before you do go on, I just do need to say that we are providing this webinar and the supporting package for informative educational purpose only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. The College for Adult Learning is an educational institution that provides a range of learning related products to adult learners to assist them in collecting and analysing information and encouraging such learners to make their own informed decisions. The content of this webinar and the supporting package do not constitute legal advice and are not meant to be complete or exhaustive. For legal advice you should always contact a trained professional and if you have specific legal questions you should seek the advice of a qualified legal practitioner. So there's quite a bit to get through today. Michael, now I've heard about small business owners ending up in court for not providing a safe workplace but I didn't realise that this had anything to do with harassment or discrimination. You know, you think of a safe workplace as providing exactly that, one that doesn't have hazards that you could get hurt by or machinery that could maim you and so on. I guess I've thought about the physical aspects of a safe workplace but perhaps not the psychological or emotional aspects. 
Uh, Sarah, it's all encompassing. <laughs> well, before we get started, it might be a good time now to run a quick poll. So I'm just going to launch it on your screen. In just a second, you will see the question, how well protected do you think your workplace is? With the answers there, very well protected. Uh, protected, not very well protected, totally unprotected, or I'm not sure. So we're getting some votes, we're almost half, or just over halfway have voted, Michael. So far, 50% are saying protected, which is pretty good at the moment. We're almost at 80% having put in their votes now. Okay, so we have 63% have voted protected uh, and another 25% have, have voted not very well protected and then the rest are saying, 13% are saying very well protected. That's interesting, Michael. Do they, does that surprise you? No, but it's absolutely no cause for complacency. Excellent. So uh, let's get the ball rolling um, and, and, and get started, Michael. Well, Sarah, um, before you did the poll, you mentioned that uh, the employer obligations under OH&S, and so let's start with our list of definitions. Now, OH&S, or OH&S is the acronym for Occupation Health and Safety. Recently, that's been changed to Workplace Health and Safety, and I'll use that from now on in. Um, the Act uh, sets out the laws about health and safety requirements affecting most workplaces, work activities and specific high-risk plant uh, in workplaces. Health and safety may refer to policies on drugs, smoking and alcohol, confidentiality, fire, evacuation, emergency procedures, first aid, fitness for duty, protective equipment, clothing, security, reporting of incidents, etc. Now you can see that from this definition, WHS is not only concerned with the physical aspects of doing a job, but really is also concerned with uh, the psychological. So how healthy and safe, how health and safe, how safe and healthy your employees are emotionally, for example, and this will become clearer in a minute. Let's deal with harassment. A person is uh, subject to workplace harassment if they're subjected to repeated behaviour, you know, that's, uh, and for this instance, behaviour other than amounting to sexual behaviour, by a person including person's employer or co-worker or a group of co-workers of the person, where the behaviour is unwelcome, unsolicited, or the person considers it to be offensive, intimidating, humility, humiliating, and threatening, or at least a reasonable person would, would consider it to be offensive, humiliating, intimidating, or threatening. Harassment is conducted by a person towards another person that reasonably causes the other person to feel vexed, persecuted, offended, humiliated, or intimidated. Generally, there is a connotation that the conduct is, uh, conduct is persistent or repeated. While this is a broad and general definition of harassment at work, sexual harassment is a specific type of harassment that over the years has been one of the most common forms of harassment in the workplace. The Australian Human Rights Commission says that sexualist harassment is any unwelcome or unwanted sexual behaviour that makes a person feel offended, humiliated or intimidated. It can take many different forms. It can be obvious or indirect, physical or verbal, repeated or one-off, and perpetrated by males and females against uh, others of uh, the same or opposite sex. Intimidation is another form of uh, workplace harassment. And it can be defined as inappropriate conduct that contains an element of threat or force by a person in an attempt to have the other person act or deter from acting in a particular way. And now we come to workplace bullying. Workplace bullying is defined as any behaviour that is repeated, systematic and directed towards an employee or group of employees that are a reasonable person having regard to the circumstances would expect to victimise, humiliate, undermine or threaten and which creates a risk to health and safety. Michael, those two definitions sound pretty familiar. Oh, uh, sorry, similar. Well, that as well. <laughs> uh, Sarah, very much two faces of the same coin. 
So you're asking me, is uh, discrimination the same uh, as then? Well, no, discrimination uh, is not bullying or harassment, although it's very often confused with them. Discrimination is uh, treating or proposing to treat someone unfavourably because of uh, personal characteristics that are protected by law. So um, this can include uh, somebody based on their protected characteristics and it prohibits discrimination based on the following. And you'll see here, for, ranging from sex and relationship status right through to, uh, you'll see coming up to political belief or activity, sexuality, etc. So it's quite a, a big, long list. Now, there are two forms of discrimination, direct. This occurs when a person is treated or is proposed that they are treated less favourably on the basis of them having an attribute than a person without the attribute would be uh, and treated in the same situation. So direct discrimination uh, often uh, occurs because people make unfair assumptions about what the person with the uh, characteristic can and can't do. So what about this for an example, Michael? John refuses to rent a flat to Claudia because Claudia is English and John doesn't like English people. Claudia's friend Brian is English and John doesn't like English people. Or John believes that English people are unreliable tenants. Well, uh, Sarah, in each case, uh, John discriminates against Claudia. Uh, whether or not John's belief about uh, Claudia or Brian's nationality or the characteristics uh, of that nationality are correct. This is because the refusal to rent is based on an attribute. Now, indirect discrimination occurs when an unreasonable condition is posed uh, that disadvantages a person with a personal characteristic protected by law. Indirect discrimination happens when a workplace policy or practice or behaviour seems to treat all workers the same but actually unfairly disadvantages someone because of a personal characteristic which is proposed uh, protected by law. So Michael, let me see an example of indirect discrimination could be the situation actually that my friend is involved with where um, an, employer, an employer has just brought in a 12 hour shift, so 12 hour shifts for the entire staff, but he is a single dad so he just can't work a 12 hour shift as he needs to be home to look after his child. So would you say that that's the sort of thing that could be seen as indirect discrimination? Um, yeah, uh, Sarah, I would. Whilst the employer appears to be acting uh, equally to everybody, in real terms they are discriminating against your friend. Now, look, since you've brought this up, it's probably time to uh, make mention of your employer obligations to develop a workplace culture that promotes a healthy work-life balance. Uh, and as part of this, under the, both the Equal Opportunities Act and the National Employment Standards with Fair Work Australia, employers must not refuse flexible work arrangements for an employee with parental or carer responsibilities unless it, it's reasonable to do so in the circumstances. Flexible work arrangements can be also an example of reasonable adjustments which are made to allow people with disability to work safely and productively. We'll look into this and your obligations as employers and managers in the video tutorial. Now, under the Fair Work Act, discrimination only happens when there is an adverse action because of a person's characteristics, such as their race, religion or sex. If the adverse action isn't based on one or more categories of discrimination, then according to Fair Work, it probably isn't discrimination but it could be bullying or harassment. So Fair Work Australia provides us with a pretty good example of this. Mary is pregnant. Uh, she works in an office where most of her co-workers participate in regular pooled lottery tickets. Mary doesn't like gambling, so she refuses to join in. Because of this, many of her co-workers make fun of her and her boss deliberately excludes her from some office discussions. Now, Fair Work says that this is unlikely to be unlawful discrimination. Even though Mary is experiencing adverse action, it isn't because she is pregnant. She's being treated badly because she has no interest in the lottery. Being treated differently because you do not like gambling is not unlawful discrimination. Mary's co-workers and boss's behaviour 
might be harassment or bullying, it's only when Mary is being treated badly because she is pregnant that Fair Work Australia says it could be unlawful discrimination. Uh, yeah, employers can be held legally responsible for acts of discrimination and sexual harassment that occur at work or connected with the workplace. So having said that, employers need to be aware that every year sexual harassment in the workplace is one of the most common types of complaints received by the Commission under the Sex Discrimination Act. In 2009-10, 21 per cent of all complaints to the uh, Commission were under the Sex Discrimination Act and a sad 88 per cent of those complaints related to sexual discrimination in the workplace. Now, the wide use of new technology such as mobile phones, email, social networking websites creates new spaces where uh, sexual harassment may occur also. So employers need to closely manage uh, these technologies in the workplace. Speaking of complaints, uh, the last important definition we, we need to uh, deal with today is victimisation. According to the Human Rights Commission, um, victimisation means subjecting a person to some form of detriment because she or he has, say, maybe lodged a complaint of discrimination or harassment. You can see the grounds there. Uh, and it's also uh, specifically prohibited under the Equal Opportunities Act and federal anti-discrimination laws. Michael, I'm not sure that I'm clear on the difference between victimisation and what constitutes harassment, bullying and discrimination. Could you possibly give us some more, uh, some more details? Uh, yeah, okay. Let's, uh, let's start with bullying and harassment. And uh, As I said, these are two sides of the same coin. Bullying and harassment are the key workplace health and safety issues of our time. And as employers, we really need to get our heads around them. They can affect anyone in a job regardless of the, uh, the tasks they perform, what kind of people they work with or what industry they're part of. These issues are, are really uh, not easy and they need to be tackled head on rather than ignored until they become so unbearable that people uh, cannot face going to work or in Brady's case. Oh. Um, harassment and, and bullying undermine a person's deeper sense of self, of who they are, as adults. We think we've got, we've figured out who we are. And so to have that completely undermined or stripped away is utterly crippling. That's why it's so destructive. The ILO says that workplace harassment and bullying constitutes offensive behaviour through vindictive, cruel, malicious, humiliating attempts to undermine an individual or group of employees. Such persistently negative attacks on their personal professional performance are typically unpredictable, irrational, unfair. Now if we look at harassment, a person is subject to workplace harassment. If the person is subjected to repeated behaviour, now here again distinguishing between sexual harassment, by a person including the person's employer or co-worker or a group of co-workers, that, and where the behaviour is unwelcome, unsolicited, where the person considers it to be offensive, intimidating, humiliating or threatening, and where the person seems unreasonable. Now, this means the reasonable person test. Would a reasonable person consider it to be offensive, humiliating, intim intimidating or threatening? Now, some examples of this can be right through from repeated uh, threats of dismissal right through to abusive, uh, ridicule, insulting, offensive behaviour, through to denying access, uh, say, for supervision and consultational resources that such are the detriment of the worker and, of course, sexual harassment. Now, let's stop and think about this for a minute or two. I really wonder how many of us have uh, been in or seen situations just like the one we've mentioned. Now, victimisation. Victimisation in the workplace can include bullying and intimidation by co-workers, being denied a promotion or being moved to a position of lower responsibility, dismissal from employment or being refused further contract work. 
Well, Michael, I, you know, I know that I wouldn't do these things and I hope that nobody in my team would either. Uh, Sarah, uh, it's important to, to note that uh, it's not good enough to say that you don't do any of these things. As a boss, you have an obligation to take all reasonable measures to ensure that nobody in your workplace does any of these things to another person. If they do, you can be held responsible, even if you didn't know it was happening. God, that's asking a lot, isn't it? I mean, I know that the team in dispatch often muck around or generally tease each other and carry on when I'm not around, but surely I can't be held responsible for their behaviour, even if I'm not there. And where does sexual harassment fit in? Sadly, on the first question, Sarah, you can and you will be held responsibility. But before I tell you how to ensure you're not responsible, let me answer your question about sexual harassment. A report from the Human Rights Commission last year found that 45% of women have been sexually harassed in the workplace in the, first, in the last five years. It's nearly half all the women at work. A survey of 2002 people found that women who speak up about abuse are more likely to be uh, labelled as troublemakers, they're more likely to be ostracised or left out by their work colleagues, and in some extreme cases they could be demoted or moved away from the job that they love. Sexual harassment disproportionately affects women, with one in five, 20 per cent, experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace at some times. It's not just about women, however, one in 20 men also report experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace. That's an interesting point to note there, Michael, that it's not just women who suffer sexual harassment. But how do you, do, how do you identify sexual harassment? Sir, sexual harassment can take many different forms. It can be obvious and very much in your face, or less obvious and indirect. It can be physical and verbal, or both, and it can be repeated or just once off. It can be perpetrated by males and females against other people of the same or opposite sex. Sexual harassment might include things like staring or leering, displaying posters and magazines, screensavers of a sexual nature. It could be uh, accessing uh, sexual explicit internet sites. The, the Sex Discrimination Act makes it unlawful for people to sexually harass another person in a number of areas, including employment, education, and the provision of goods and services and accommodation. Now, this is an area of discrimination where we're all more aware, but as business owners, you need to be aware of things that you don't always see, like the inside of your employees' lockers. Gone are the days where you could have questionable pinups on the door, outside door of your locker. You also need to be very careful with jokes and the type of jokes that might be told in groups of employees. Nowadays, this implies to groups of women just as it does to groups of men. There are so many ways that employees can inadvertently and or deliberately practice sexual discrimination. I know I'm sounding a bit like a broken record here, Michael, but surely we can't be held responsible for an employee surfing internet dating sites and posting comments on them that other employees might see. I mean, how can we stop them from doing that? Likewise, I can't tell you the number of times I've been asked about my private life. How do we stop that? Sure, I do with the first thing. Yes, you can be held liable. Now, secondly, um, you can be responsible for the unwanted behaviour of employees unless you implement processes in your workplace that actively discourage this. Um, we'll come to this shortly, but let's go back to bullying and just what it comprises. As I mentioned earlier, bullying is characterised by an abuse of power, where vulnerable targets are pushed into positions from which they have no avenue of escape. Importantly, the concept of a power imbalance is not just limited to traditional worker manager hierarchies. Bullying can be downwards from superior to subordinates. It can also be upwards from subordinates to superiors. It can also be horizontal amongst uh, co-workers. In her address at the official opening of the Bullying Free Australia Foundation headquarters earlier this year, the 
Former Prime Minister Julia Gillard said that last year, 2012, 2,500 Australians committed suicide, of whom 450 were children. Bullying was identified as a factor in 80% of those deaths. That's 2,000 people. A recent report by the Productivity Commission has highlighted the significant impact of bullying in the workplace, which could cost an estimated $36 billion in productivity each year. The fact that the Fair Work, Fair Work Commission has given $21 odd million over the next four years to fund legal remedies for victims of workplace bullying shows just how serious the issue is and how important it is to be managing the issue of productivity, or pro sorry, proactively. Workplaces become such a big issue in Australian workplaces that frankly we've devoted an entire webinar to that topic and you can find out more detail about what bullying is, its cost of business and the statistics that show just how prevalent it is by listening to that webinar. This webinar is a part of our pack on harassment in the workplace that you can purchase later. Now it's important to note that with bullying and sexual discrimination there's no out clause if you're not aware that you're doing it. Most definitions of bullying do not include intent as a requirement. Instead, the core component of bullying is said to be the subjective perception of the person that repeated acts are hostile, humiliating or intimidating or unreasonable in the nature of the actions themselves. This is very similar to some definitions of sexual harassment where the perpetrator frankly might not have intended to cause humiliation or embarrassment, but their sexually suggestive actions may have contributed to a target feeling intimidated or harassed. Most significantly for us all, the intent of the perpetrator is not required to be established. So you can't say you didn't mean it. So who can bully? Now, in terms of your obligation to your workforce, it's important to note that you're responsible for workplace harassment or bullying that might occur between employees in the same or different work areas, uh, employers and contractors, uh, during work organised events or even possibly outside working hours, and while off-site such as external meetings, interstate visits, etc. Gosh, Michael, there just seems to be so much to get your head around. And the responsibility extends even when you send staff, for example, on trips or anywhere outside of the office. And really, I mean, this is outside of your, outside of your control or care. Uh, yes, sir, that's right. But look, here are some clear definition of what isn't bullying or what isn't harassment, although it's frankly sometimes hard to tell the difference. Uh, examples of behaviours that are not harassment include things like expressing differences of opinion, providing constructive and courteous feedback, and, or making complaints about a manager's or another employee's conduct if the complaint is made in a proper and reasonable way. People's perceptions can differ about behaviour that is disrespectful or harassment or harassing. Some people might perceive a supervisor's approach as being assertive, yet the person effective, affected may think that the supervisor's tone is inappropriate or rude, sarcastic or belittling. The key factor is the circumstances, is what a reasonable person would conclude from the behaviour. Employees from various reason, uh, various cultural and social backgrounds might also have different views and expectations of cultural norms and appropriate workplace behaviour. Sometimes, even though a, mas a, mas a manager has uh, tried to create a friendly and open environment, people working for them may feel intimidated because of the manager's status. A word of caution here. Whilst it's good to practice assertive communication style at work, you need to remember that under pressure, an assertive management style may give, give way to what may be interpreted as bullying behaviours. 
Managers need to be sensitive about how they are perceived by others and should know the best ways to communicate difficult or sensitive matters. In some situation, behaviour that is not intended to be humiliating, threatening or demeaning in fact may cause distress and may be perceived as bullying. Being open to another person's perspective and genuinely listening to their concerns before coming to a conclusion may, uh, frankly, assist in diffusing a potentially troublesome situation. On a serious note, bullying is a very big issue that can impact every organisation. In fact, workplace bullying is a severe and persistent, pervasive problem that plagues workplaces right across the globe. Bullying in the workplace is devastating to targets, causes severe harm to organisations and frankly has no meaningful value in any workplace. For individuals, the personal cost can include physical and psychological injury, injuries, loss of enjoyment, satisfaction of work and in some cases the loss of job and you know, future career opportunities. For employers, the cost can include reduced employee morale and productivity, increased absenteeism, staff turnover, increased costs associated with counsellors, mediation staff training, increased legal costs, workers' comp claims, and overall loss of reputation. One of the hidden costs associated with a broad range of legal action can result from bullying uh, and harassment in the workplace, and this can include claims on uh, occupational health and safety legislation, anti-discrimination legislation, unfair dismissals claims, workers' comp claims, breach of contract claims. These costs are too great. Well, Michael, I can see the potential direct cost this type of behaviour can have or can be to an organisation. So I guess it does make good business sense to try to, do, to try and do all you can to make sure this behaviour doesn't happen in your workplace. But there's also the potential for quite significant costs with the non-compliance. And this usually becomes public when an employee sues an employer. How does this work? Uh, sure. Well, it's, you've just taken us to the next topic, which we'll call uh, employer and employee uh, responsibilities. Uh, workplace bullying and harassment and discrimination can be stamped out through early intervention, increased awareness, understanding in the workplaces, both large and small. All workers, managers and employees have a leadership role to play in promoting a work culture where all workers are treated with respect and dignity and bullying, harassment and discrimination are not tolerated in any form. Employers and managers have a legal duty to protect the health and safety and welfare of their employees and of other people in the workplace whose health and safety might be affected by the work being undertaken. This duty could include risks arising from discrimination, harassment and bullying. Employers must assess risks to their employees and take appropriate measures to prevent or reduce risk and must consult their employees when considering decisions which may affect employees' health and safety. In saying all this, it's important to remember that employers are entitled to give legal directions, employees are obliged to comply with lawful direction, and whether or not uh, conduct amounts to bullying will depend upon the circumstances. Employees have a role to play here and they must contribute to workplace health and safety by not putting others at risk, um, cooperating with uh, any health and safety requirements of their employer, informing their employer of any workplace hazards that they're aware of, including bullying, and complying with uh, bullying prevention procedures that are implemented in the workplace. Employees can also be individually prosecuted for breaches of these obligations. Uh, an example of a situation in which employees were individually prosecuted for behaviour in a workplace amounting to bullying, uh, let's, and let's have a look at the decision of uh, Inspector uh, Gregory uh, Munnerfoot and the MA uh, Coleridge Joinery in New South Wales. So in July 2004, a radio announcer employed by Radio Ballarat was personally prosecuted, convicted and fined 
$10,000 by the Victorian Magistrates Court for the offence under Victorian OHS legislation of failing to take reasonable care and willfully placing at risk the health and safety of other employees in his workplace. The prosecution was based upon a course of sustained verbal abuse and bullying of his fellow employees over a period of three years. The employer was, in respect of the same events, separate, separately convicted and fined $50,000. So in this case, the radio announcer got a $10,000 fine, while the employer received a conviction and a fine of $50,000. An awful lot of money for any business to cough up. And not to mention the damage to reputation and the stain a conviction has on a business and its future business prospects. So what can you do as an employer to make your workplace safe and to comply with the legislation, Michael? From an employer's perspective, it's really important to be clear and upfront with your employees that workplace uh, harassment will not be tolerated. Now you can and should talk about this with employees. This is of course is important, but it's not enough by itself. There must be walk as well as talk. You must have your approach to these issues and the way in which you want your workplace uh, to run written down so that there's no confusion, certainly no dispute or argument as to what sort of workplace and indeed organisation you have. Now the way to do this is by writing a clear policy that tells all employees just what sort of value your company has and clearly states what's acceptable work behaviour and what's not. It's not good enough just to have uh, written policies in place. You also need to have processes whereby you uh, communicate it to all your employees. Uh, that's fairly easy uh, uh, at induction. However, if you don't have a uh, current policy in place that all your employees are aware of, then you'll either have to tell each person individually or you could uh, introduce it at a team meeting. Now, again, it's not just good enough to tell employees uh, where they start, where the policy is and where it can be found. It's a very good start though. But you, you need to reinforce it periodically where you think, uh, or where you think uh, the workforce might be at more at risk and or where you again think there might be some training required. An employer should also uh, encourage reporting on discrimination, harassment and you also need to uh, make sure that any manager is also aware of any signs of workplace harassment, discrimination, bullying, so that steps can be taken at an early stage. So then, at a minimum, an employer or the employee representative, uh, employer representative must have policies in place to prevent the discrimination uh, and uh, harassment and bullying and ensure that all employees and agents and contractors fully understand their duties and responsibilities. The video package that comes with this webinar will explain more about how to actually write a policy as well as to provide you with a complete set of policies already written to suit most small to medium businesses environments so that uh, all you really need to do is to insert your company details, file them and let your staff know uh, where they are and also then to make sure that they really do know and live them. And in the video we'll tell you exactly how to do this as well as giving you some recent examples of some, some of the fines imposed when things go wrong. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Michael. It's simple, it's easy to do, and it means that you'll be doing the right thing as an employer to try to stop any sign of harassment, discrimination or bullying. If you would like to get hold of the video package, just let me know and I'll organise to have it sent to you after this webinar. Our contact details will be up soon. But Michael, getting back to the must-do actions for employers, it's also written in the legislation, isn't it? Don't you have to have these policies in place to comply with the law? Um, sure, that's a, <laughs> there's a yes and no answer to that. Uh, you've got an obligation under the law to provide a self, uh, safe and healthy workplace, but not necessarily to keep uh, policies and procedures per se. It just happens that if you follow the business best, if you follow business best practice of ensuring your values and processes are written down, then you can be sure you're safe insofar as you're doing what you can to provide a safe workplace for employees. 
let's uh, then have a look at some of the legislation. Well, you'll see that there's both uh, Commonwealth and uh, Victorian legislation, state legislation which applies there. And there's quite a real list of it. Um, you can see them there. Although these actions pertain to, uh, in Victoria, for example, 90% uh, of discrimination and harassment uh, in Victoria is done under the Equal Opportunities Act. Uh, under the Act, an employer or principal will be held liable for any breaches of the Act by an employer or agent unless the uh, employee took reason the employer took reasonable precautions to prevent the discrimination or harassment taking place. So that's why it's so important that you've got these policies and procedures in place. Now, enforcement under the Act uh, can take various forms like issuing for improvement of prohibition or non-disturbance notices. You can also be uh, prosecuted for uh, breach of the WHS legislation. In fact, very substantial fines and penalties can be imposed for uh, health and safety offences and a court can also make uh, other types of orders including things like adverse uh, publicity orders. Michael, will this change when the new changes take effect and it moves to the federal jurisdiction? Um, Sir, so whilst the, the new Act is being rolled out across Australia, uh, Victoria yet hasn't adopted and won't do so until 2014. It, Victoria's taken a, a watch and learn approach first off, but there's very little doubt that will be adopted and then all states will conform with one federal act rather than having to double check what your status is and how it applies. Uh, in any case, whilst our uh, WHS laws are still current, the model WHS laws are pretty much the same. I should also point out that under section 27 of the model WHS laws it says, an officer must exercise due diligence to ensure that the person conducting the business or undertaking complies with their duties under the Act. It's highly recommended that proprietors or officers apply the due diligence provisions of the model WHS laws to ensure that they could mount a defence that they are taking reasonable care. Now, look, that clause is pretty clear, isn't it? You really must comply with due diligence provisions to ensure you can provide an adequate defence if you're, if you're charged. Having a comprehensive set of policies and procedures in place goes a long way to ensuring that discrimination, harassment and bullying can't find a foothold in your business. And of course, encouraging a culture of respect and openness and one that encourages and celebrates diversity that also provides a strong and positive foundation where negative behaviours are just not tolerated. But you mentioned legislation as well, yes. Um, every employer has a responsibility to provide a safe work environment where there's no violence, no harassment of any kind and of course no bullying. This protects your right to work and in Australia there are also laws in place that in, uh, protect employees from some other quite specific forms of bullying and harassment. The Australian Human Rights Commission has a lot of useful information for employers and employees on their website, as well as some uh, really useful uh, and helpful fact sheets. If you, if you want to check whether you're complying with the law and basic human rights of all employees, then I, suggest, I really suggest you check this site out. Also, if you find yourself in the middle of a situation that might involve bullying, but you don't have enough information, or reason to directly intervene, you, you can download a number of useful brochures and fact sheets in various forms and types of bullying so that you can give to the people you're concerned about. You can also obtain useful information on bullying from, Fair Work, from the Fair Work Australia website. Information pertaining to a safe and healthy workplace can also be found on your state WorkSafe authority. Uh, in Victoria, that's called WorkSafe Vic. Now, as well as this uh, uh, information that's available to assist you, uh, 
it's not of itself enough. You have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Thanks, Michael. I, we do need to stop this so that we can open the floor up to questions. We've had some great questions uh, coming through that I'll read out to you now. The first one is, one of the girls I work with is very timid and lacking in self-confidence, so she can be a bit annoying because she keeps interrupting us all the time, asking pretty stupid questions and looking for reassurance. Lately, though, I've noticed a change in her behaviour where she has withdrawn from us and just doesn't say anything anymore but also doesn't get the work done that she needs to. Or if she does, it's often done poorly and has to be fixed up. Her work and her attitude have really gone downhill and I have a feeling someone is bothering or perhaps even bullying her, but I don't really have any evidence. It's just a strong feeling that I'm getting. What can I do? Sarah, first of all, uh, make diary notes. On each situation that you've observed something, please make diary notes. You may then... Uh, uh, you might then have a discussion with the person directly concerned, but you have to do that very sensitively. Secondly, you could also uh, uh, bring in some uh, employee assistance programming, counselling and things like that, just to see what it is. Uh, there may be issues which come up during your performance management reviews, but what I'd suggest as a manager, being very alert and being very sensitive to what's going on in the environment, very closely monitoring it and making your notes. Okay, the next one is around victimisation, providing too much work. How do you distinguish this when all employees work long hours, longer than required, but says in their EBA additional reasonable hours? One is crying harassment. Where is the definition? Where do we stand? Um, that, 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 that's a very hard case. Uh, and what I'd be suggesting, if the workloads are unreasonable, that be uh, brought to uh, management's attention um, and discussed. You might also have in your workplace a uh, health and safety representative and you could potentially uh, draw that to their attention. Okay, another one here. You mentioned indirect discrimination and gave the example of the 12-hour shift. I thought this was okay for companies as long as everyone worked the same shift. It's quite a similar question. Is there something I need to do to make sure that I'm not indirectly discriminating against a member of staff? Uh, yes, Sarah, to, to make sure you know the circumstances of each member of staff and also give uh, people the opportunity to discuss those matters with you, particularly if they do feel that they're being discriminated against. Okay. I am worried about all the emphasis on bullying and the rights of employees that one day a disgruntled employee will accuse me or another manager of bullying just because they don't like us. These accusations are like mud and seem to stick even when you know you're totally innocent. What can I do to avoid these? Uh, Sarah, if people want to throw mud, they will. So. Uh, you must ensure that you've got a very comprehensive set of policies and procedures in place. You must ensure that all your employers and managers uh, and your staff, contractors, etc., are very, very aware of the policies. Uh, you need to document any behaviour that you have, particularly your own or your interactions with others, where, which you think might lead to. Uh, 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 considerations of harassment and finally you should draw that matter to your manager's attention that you have those concerns and please make sure that they are documented. Okay, here's a, here's a bit of a tricky one for you Michael. Where do we stand if we know under the table of an affair between employees? We have husband and wife teams so not banned in the work. Oh, they're not banned in the workplace. But when the affair goes sour and one cry starts to cry harassment. Oh, <laughs> Sarah, that's uh, that's a very very difficult question. But if uh, there is a uh, an imbalance in power, and, and uh, particularly if you are aware of it, doesn't matter whether it's under the table or not. If you're aware of it then you are starting to take on liability for people's reactions. And uh, if it's there, the perception, the perception 
is what's really important. You might not have actually been discriminating or harassing, but the perception of it uh, could well be there. So please, uh, that's a very, very difficult situation and to be quite frank, I would document it and I would go and seek proper legal advice. Okay, we've got a couple more before we quickly wrap up. I am managing a poor performance issue at the moment where I'm meeting with my staff member every week to review his KPIs and progress against the goals we set each week. Our last meeting got a bit heated and at the end he mentioned that I was bullying him. I am now really anxious and scared and I don't want a bullying charge against me, but at the same time I feel like I'm following due process and doing everything right. What can I do? Uh, again, uh, please uh, document those things. Make sure you well and truly have documented. This could be an example of, in fact, a, a subordinate uh, bullying a, uh, a manager. Uh, you might need to speak with your, uh, your own direct manager and draw that to her or his attention. You might also need to uh, draw that to the attention of your uh, human resource team and you might also need to uh, to take some uh, legal advice uh, on your best course of action. But I would take the matter seriously. Mm -hmm. Is there a... It, oh, I can't quite read that. Is there a statute of limitations on harassment? If someone has not been with the workplace for many years yet he feels they still suffer psychologically because of their time here, hypothetically. Does that make sense to you, Michael? Yeah. Um, and again, in the circumstances, I would strongly go and suggest that you seek uh, legal opinion on that. Uh, it will depend on, if you're aware of it now, uh, that damage can, even though the person has left the workplace. So, look, uh, I'd suggest take legal advice on that. All right, no worries. I do have to uh, wrap it up. Thank you so much for all of your terrific questions. If you do have any more that you didn't quite get through or get answered, please do contact us and let us know. I'll make sure Michael gets back to you right away. So don't forget uh, that you can get the instructions on what to do and how to implement your policies and procedures by purchasing the pack on your screen. This will give you a full set of instructions and policies so that all you need to do is follow them. Now the pack will also give you some more examples of case studies so you can see just how easily you can get caught up in issues related to discrimination, harassment and bullying. And it will also run through some of the recent decisions handed down and the fines given to businesses like yours so you can see for yourself just how much this could cost your company if you don't address it. The pack is only $47 and it contains a video tutorial, a set of policies, instructions to implement and as well as all of that will also give you another very popular webinar that we ran recently specifically on workplace bullying so you can learn more about this insidious behaviour. Also Cal does uh, offer a wide range of related short courses that you can access online in your own time. We have a number of short courses on a wide range of management, HR, sales and PM topics. You can find it on our website and also these courses can be delivered in-house with your team. Our contact details are up on the screen. Now you can visit our website and have a look at what we're offering. Pop us through an email, give us a call, check out what's happening in the world of Facebook or you can watch Cal's very own YouTube channel. But that's all from us now, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to our regulars and thanks to our newcomers from uh, small businesses in and around Richmond. We hope you've enjoyed it. We've loved having your company. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everybody. And we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.